Welcome to another episode of Barman Saturdays, and it's time to take a look at Napoleon. Jeez, sorry about that. And this is the American dub. Yeah, there's two English dubs for this film, the Australian dub and the American dub. Why it got dubbed into English again for America, I have no idea. Maybe they thought, you know, that accent would be so off-putting, people wouldn't be willing to watch it. You know, it's like, we don't want to hear Australians talking, you know, from a cute little doggy. We want to have Americans voicing that doggy and all these side characters that exist, you know, for just a few scenes at most. In fact, most of the characters in this film pop up in, like, one scene. Like, uh, Wallace Shawn's character, the Echidnas, in one scene. And stop looking at me! Oh, everyone makes fun of the way I look! <laughs> hey, I think you look sharp! You see? That lasts, like, maybe five minutes, and the same applies to some other characters as well. Like... They exist mostly for padding or comedic effect. Let's see. No wild dogs on this link. No, none over here. Hey, what's the big idea? Oh, I forgot to mention. Can't see faster than three feet. But they add nothing to the overall story, so it's just like, why are they even here? I mean, brevity is the soul of wit, as they say. Don't waste my time, basically. But I suppose if they didn't waste my time, this wouldn't be a cult classic, because it has... All the staples of a bad movie, you know, like bad jokes. I have a bird joke for you. What does a 500 pound parrot say? Polly want a cracker? No! Polly want a cracker? <laughs> oh, hold on! <laughs> oh, that is a scream! I can't wait a minute! What? That is not a bit funny. That is insulting to parrots. Bruno! It's just a stereotype. Bad special effects. You're heading into the fire! Bad practical effects. Uh, a storyline that feels paper thin, and that's being generous probably in describing it. You know, it's not a very well thought out plot with Napoleon, or a uh, muffin, deciding to run away from home, and he gets some help, you know, from the kids having a bunch of balloons tied to a basket, and he just floats away, you know, from s this big city and lands, you know, on the shoreline. Now he's like, I'm a free wild dog. And then has to learn, you know, like, oh, I thought there'd be no rules, but now I have to deal with the rules of survival and all that stuff. And eventually realizes he just wants to go home. Because the dingo points out, like, you know, you found the wild dogs. But, you know, you were already a wild dog in spirit already. You didn't have to come out here and live with us. Because you have to be brave, or at least uh, fearless, to decide to jump into a flash flood to save one of my pups. Which uh, Napoleon does, despite, you know, spending a good chunk of the movie early on talking about how much he hates water. And decides to, you know, change his tune by the end of the movie. I guess that's his character growth. He got over his fear of uh, H2O. That's just some amazing character growth there, I suppose. But, yeah, he also proves his courage by dealing with a deranged cat that just constantly comes back. Because, of course it does. It's got nine lives. Like... Throw it into a river in the middle of the night. It slinks off eventually, you know, like one life down, gets thrown off of the, a cliff. Another life down, just comes back. Like, this cat, I swear, is like immortal. Like, why? And how does it make some of those sounds? Because they're weird. I mean, maybe they're actual cat sounds, but I've never seen a cat make a sound like that before. <laughs> But, yeah, uh, Napoleon eventually, you know, just heads home after his adventure, which they basically cut through how he gets to the city back to his house after being dropped off by a turtle. Like, he gets a ride from a turtle back to the big city, and then he's just like, let's just see him heading towards the big city, then, you know, we cut to him running home and jumping a fence, because he's also gotten bigger and wiser while he was away, too. Despite being only, like, a couple days as far as the movie presents itself, with them have to deal with wildfires... Almost being run over by a stampede of horses, going over mountains, hot deserts. Like, I honestly don't know where they had this film being shot at. I know it had to be Australia, because, you know, the Australian wildlife. But it's just like, how this puppy covers so much ground so fast? Because, you know, how do you go from, you know, a frozen mountain peak to hot desert? I mean, I guess Australia, you know, is different than the U.S. when it comes, you know, how close biomes can be to each other, but it's just, you know, I assume these would be tens, if if not, like, dozens upon dozens of miles apart, and puppies are not known, you know, for being awake for super long periods and 
going for long, long, long walks, man. Like, I remember when Maggie was a puppy, she'd be out for a little bit, then just be like, nap time, oh, oh I'm up again, I'm happy, I'm hyper, like, oh, bam, down for another nap. It's just like, there's a reason why when they made this film, they needed 52 puppies. Even though this film was or was uh, apparently shot over like 28 weeks, yeah, they went through 52 puppies, because every three weeks, they're like, we need another batch of puppies, because these puppies are getting too big. And it'll be too obvious, you know, we're using multiple puppies for this film. So, yeah, basically for every scene in this film, they used eight or nine different puppies, because they're like, well, they sleep, we can use them for filming for a short period of time, then they want to take another nap. Though it doesn't help that you can argue they kind of tortured some of the puppies by uh, almost drowning them. Like, who thought that was a good idea? I mean, I guess they're like, well, we have to have him prove himself to the dingo somehow. You know, so, you know, he can get told that he should go back home. By a wise dingo mother, you know, like, like, okay, film, I, I guess I'm just gonna have to roll with it, but it's just like, do you have to pick something so dangerous? Like, seriously, it wasn't a good idea. I didn't see, see anything about dogs dying during the film of this, though. Unlike a certain other franchise, aka Snow Buddies, I haven't forgiven you, buddy franchise, for that one. Ugh. But yeah, this film is enjoyably bad for some people, but, you know, if you're not into really bad films, you're probably going to find this one pretty boring. Unless you're a kid, who will probably be a lot more willing to give this a pass. He's like, oh, look at the cool animals. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I would recommend seeing it, but like I said, it's, it's definitely, you know, not everyone's cup of tea. So if you don't enjoy this film, you know, early on, or find at least in watchable, uh, just, just skip it. <laughs> like, like, don't torture yourself with the entire thing. Because it's not like it gets better. I'm just like, this is one of those, like, really bad films that you enjoy for all the wrong reasons. I am Conan! Killer Penguin! I am young! I'm alive! Ah, not a mouse, a dog. Dog must die! 